So, the subject of today's presentation starts with the insight that sustainability is deciding our future, because what is unsustainable will, by definition, not work in the long run, right? So, where do we start this journey? We started with this book. How many have seen this before? Most of you. Good. Then you know exactly what it's about. It's, it's about the price of food and it takes... Um, it looks into different places in the world where the food that we eat in Sweden is produced. And it, this was rightfully awarded Sula Journalistriset last year. Uh, in spite of the fact that it has a subtitle that is untrue. I'm not sure you can see, but it says the book that the food industry doesn't want you to read. Um, coming from Polarbröd and together with my colleagues, um, we are part of the food industry. And we do want people to read this. And this presentation is about why we would like people to read this. So let's start with this one. I'm sure everyone has, has seen this too. Uh, or sh maybe I should... Should I explain it a little bit? Uh, no, you've seen it before. It's Johan Rockström's A Safe Operating Space for Humanity from Nature, September 2009. And we can see how humanity's activities are transgressing the safe space for human development in at least three areas. Climate change at 12 o'clock, the nitrogen cycle, phosphorus coming close to at 4 o'clock, and biodiversity loss at 7, 8 o'clock. So, this is a quite bleak picture, but there is one a happy story that one can tell in connection to this picture, and it's about three o'clock, the strat stratospheric ozone depletion. When we found, found out that uh, the uh, CFCs destroy the ozone layer, we just did something about it. With the Montreal Protocol of 1987, governments agreed to face, to set laws that would ensure the phasing out of the damaging chemicals. So, the interesting question here is, if that's possible when it comes to uh, the ozone, why aren't we doing anything about the other transgressions? The even worse transgressions. And I've looked into this issue from the perspective of being I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, you did made, made a good job of presenting myself. I can also say that I'm. My background is I, I was in research. I'm, I'm. I have a PhD in conflict management. Very interested in global issues and systemic problem solving. And I'm also um, working as a strategist in in Polarbred because I'm part of the fifth generation at the helm of this family business. It was my great. Mm -hmm great-great-great-grandfather who started baking this bread in Elfsbyn, northern Sweden. So with this combination, I started to look into this mystery of why we aren't doing anything about the worst transgressions. And my conclusion is that it has to do with this. Försörjning. I couldn't find one word in English that encompasses all of the meanings that this word carries. So you can say it's, 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 it's a, it means supply, it can mean to provide for, uh, and it can also mean what we do for a living. Let's look at the case of Finland. What did people do for a living in 1920? Um, the green area shows that 70% of the Finnish workforce was employed in agriculture and forestry as late as in 1920. 90 years ago, about. Uh, the, the dark blue shows the number of people employed in industry, and the little pale blue sliver that 
that says public and private service is just about five, six percent. And when people work, when this is how you provide for yourselves, um, you will not have the resources to have more people work with services than this. At least this is what it looks like empirically in, in other parts of the world too, that are in this phase now. So, and you can see that levels of trade and retail transportation and construction are modest. But then something happened. It was the industrialization of agriculture. So you people at SLU, you are working with something that is at the heart of modern society. How we provide ourselves with food, because we can't be without food. We can abstain from many other things, but never from food, right? So with this, this and this is a picture from, uh, as you can see, SLU. Uh, this is sw Swedish use of nitrogen and phosphorus um, fertilizers. And uh, according to Robert, who is an, another colleague of ours who has been working at Grans in Ayubin, he says that this is globally quite modest use of, do you agree? Most other, many other industrialized countries, yeah, use much more. Anyway, with this, if this created efficient food production and abundance that made this possible. This is a depiction of shares of spending started over there in 1900 and ending here in 2005. And 100% is simply the size of what your income. And as we can see, as late as in 1920, people in Finland, this is Finland again because Statistik Centralen there has excellent data. So <laughs> you just can find out. Uh, but I have heard that it's, it was about the same in Sweden. Not, not a very big difference. If anybody knows something else, I would be it would be uh, improvement on this presentation. Anyway, at, as late as 1920, uh, 70% of people's income was needed for food and clothing. And with this industrialization, you can see, especially after World War II, this share has declined steadily. And if we also add the fact that purchasing power has more than, um, is, is increased more than 10 times as well, you can see that this is actually a depiction of a modern industrial society and its enormous purchasing power. We can afford to spend, with this cheap food and clothing, we can have much more, we can afford much more housing expenses, uh, communication, recreation, leisure, and other things. And uh, there has been changes in the labor market as well, correspondingly. Uh, you can see these two circular diagrams that to the right in 2004 in Finland, 4% were now employed in agriculture and forestry. And industry, I think, was about 16%, if I remember correctly. And these two small slivers could now produce a physical uh, surplus big enough to um, allow some 32% to work of the Finnish workforce to work in the in the public sector. This is the public sector. This is Vårdskola uh, Omsorg. And interestingly enough, you see in 1920 the pale blue was both pr public and private services combined. And now it's so much, so many people are working in services that it's split into different uh, bits. This entirely new one, it's supposed to be purple. Um, it's business and financial service insurance. Entirely new chunk of work because there is so much wealth coming from, from the land. either in Scandinavia or if we import cheap food, as we do, I think it's 50%, something about that. Am I right? Of the food we eat 
come from outside the borders of this country. So this is why <laughs> we aren't easily doing anything about the transgressions I showed you from Johan Rockström's diagram. This is my analysis, anyway. Another angle at the same issue is this one. This is Jonathan Foley, professor from Minnesota. You've heard about him. Um, he has... Um, nobody heard about him? Okay. Some... Okay. So, uh, he has led a research team that has compiled aerial photography of the entire uh, Earth's surface, and he ha they have reached this conclusion. Ast uh, an astonishing 40% of the Earth's land surface is devoted to agriculture. The, the green areas are croplands, where we grow the food that we actually eat or directly, and the brown areas are pastures where um, we have uh, animals herded that will then secondarily eat. Um, so, and this is not just any land, this is the best land available. This is where most other species would like to thrive. And uh, this is why agriculture is the main force, the main driving force behind every single one of the worst transgressions in this picture. And that was a big aha moment for me, so to speak, when I understood uh, that this is actually the, the methane coming from livestock and rice, um, the, where you cultivate rice, is the main, are the main drivers for, for climate change. Uh, of course, this has to do with fertilization, and because of the land and water use, <coughs> where, we, where we grow our food and cotton and other things that we want to have from, from Earth, we, it is also the main driver behind biodiversity loss. So, what activities will prove sustainable, given this perspective? Is Polarbrud sustainable? When me and my sister um, became, uh, we got the main ownership from our parents in 2006 of this um, company, we started out with, with asking, asking this question, and we hardly dared to tell our mom <laughs> that we wondered whether it was ethically defensible to bake bread in the, in the north of Sweden and to sell most of it to, to customers quite far to the south, because Sweden is, Sweden is a long country. Um, so, uh, because for her, at Polarbred, at Polarbred we've always had this um, culture of juggling many many um, goals, many hand seen, as we say in Swedish. Um, so it, it profit is important, yes, but it's mostly regarded as a means, not an end. It's a means that can allow us to have integrity in long-term thinking. We aren't depend if we are profitable, we're not dependent, uh, dependent on somebody that need, uh, we need somebody to loan money to us or something like that. I another important goal is to provide, my to our mom the most important, is to provide local jobs in small villages in northern Sweden where it, uh, there it's very hard to find other jobs. If, if we would fail, it would be a disaster for, for Elspin, for instance. So, um, so we, and also an another goal is <laughs> simply to, you know, proudly provide everyone who wants with, with this kind of bread that's typical northern Sweden bread. So this is from my great grandfathers who, who, was very, who were very much like that. So we, we have this collection of, of goals and, and, um, and good things we would like to provide. And we want, my sister and me from the younger generation wanted to include the issue of sustainability more put it more, it's always been there, because resource efficiency has been a, the core value of our, of our company since it started. But we wanted to really, you know, put us to the test, so we made life cycle analysis, life cycle analysis. We had, we commissioned Seek to do it for us. Maud, <laughs> maybe you were involved. <laughs> Katarina Lorenzon, you know her, yeah. 
So they made this uh, in 2007, and the results were quite reassuring, actually, because first of all, food is necessary, right? We need food, and bread is among the best foods. And we did this in a climate perspective specifically, and looking at it, at it that way, it turned out that bread is the most, it's just root vegetables and apples that are better in terms of nutrition per climate uh, impact. So it's, it's a very good s staple to, people should eat a lot of food, bread for food if we want to save the world. So that's a good thing, for the, just for start. Then we have, as I s told you before, we've always had a focus on what I call tier one sustainability, maybe. Never heard that before, beca probably because I invented it a couple of weeks ago. W by, <laughs> by tier one sustainability, I mean when, when you're resource efficient within the prevailing supply system. So if you, are, if you reduce waste, if you s sort of fine tune everything so you have everything runs smoothly and, and uh, you, you make use as, as, as much as possible of every resource along the way, you are tier one sustainable, you're resource efficient. And uh, our bakeries are hydropower driven. We have a lot of hydropower electricity in the north of Sweden. Uh, and just recently, we, with the um, division of Sweden into four different uh, electrical mm, distribution areas, we also get cheaper, actually, electricity. Um, because of we, we freeze, br I don't know if you know that, but it, it goes, it's, it's this big linear line in, in the bakery. And it, b when it, after it comes from the oven, it goes to the Svalbana, Cindy. What's that? <laughs> cooling line, okay, 20 minutes on the cooling line and then into the freezer. So it's, fr it, it's frozen directly after baking, and that makes our, we, we have very low, uh, low waste. Not, uh, not so much uh, svin. Um, and then we also, as much as possible, you make use of the return freight. That, um, because 70% of the food that's eaten in Norrbotten is imported from the south. And there are still empty uh, railroad trucks and uh, railroad um, cars and, and uh, trucks that go to the south because of this food supply. So, so this was uh, uh, factored in into the life cycle analysis and turned out that we were, we were pretty equal to the other bakeries in Sweden and bakeries were the best, um, among the best in the class. So we quite naively we just thought that this was the only issue we need, well, as it might be actually. <laughs> The biggest uh, impact from what we're doing is from agriculture. We got, we know that we got that information from Seek already in 2007. So maybe we should try to sell more organic bread. And we have we have organic bread uh, for uh, Horeca, that is, uh, hotels, restaurants, and things like that. But we have not succeeded yet. Uh, we tried in 2008 when we got this information um, to. Uh, launch this <coughs> thin bread baked from ecological um, flour. And this is Bredbyn, another small village where we have another of our bakeries. And unfortunately we didn't succeed because it, it didn't sell. And here we come to the, the issue of how much people want to pay for their food. So. Um, what more do you have, are, are we struggling with here? We are struggling with infrastructure. This is from last fall when w we have, as, as I told you before, as much as possible of our long um, distance freight on rail, railroad. But this last fall, there was this threat that it was going to be shut down because uh, it was not profitable for the operator green cargo and uh, we protested protested quite 
fiercely about that and, and got to meet the infrastructural min minister, min minister of infrastructure, uh, Katarina Elmsetter Svad, and a very skillful politician. And she um, she listened to us and somehow, I don't know what happened, but there was a, a negotiation and it didn't close down. So it, there was a slight, um, some parts were actually lost. So we had this setback. We always want to increase the, the amount of, of um, freight we use, uh, put on, ra on the rail. And there was this setback because we can't, we need the, the pieces to the puzzle to be there in, the, in society in order to become more sustainable. If there is no working railroad freight, we have to use roads and that feels like um, going back. So it was. This was. It was good that it. It didn't get worse anyway. So, uh, what more do we know about sustainability from the pers point of view of Polarbröd? Um, there is this aspect of what, what, what good things of modern society can we keep if we live in a society in a society that is uh, sustainable. It has to do with productivity. How much of this modern world productivity can we keep? And let's look at this, our company as a case. This is 1920. My grandfather, Murfar Gösta, is the little guy with the white collar in the middle. There. This is 1920. He was three years old. And uh, a skillful baker at this time made about three kilos of, of uh, flat nor Norlands, nor <laughs> Norlandish bread uh, per hour at this time in, the, in their wood-fired stove. And last year, we in Elspin had a productivity of, three of 100 kilos per hour at work because it's industrialized. And this made us able to pay um, 89.7 million kronor in wages and 75.6 million in taxes, helping to sustain uh, Sweden's large public sector. If you th think back at the circular diagrams. So this is how industry provides the resources that make modern society possible. So we are actually at the sort of I find, as being a researcher, I find us a very interesting case. If we can change so that we can become tier two sustainable, that is not just resource efficient within the prevailing system of supply, but actually for real sustainable uh, in re relation to planetary boundaries, then we can keep some measures of I figure, of the modern world's comforts. Because we are in the bread business and we have <coughs> access to pure renewable energy and we are, self, we are, we are not dependent on uh, quartals, capitalism, quor quarterly, <laughs> quarterly capitalism. Because we, if we want to do something, if we agree in the family, we, if we want to invest for in the long term, we can do that. So if we can't, who can? It's sort of the, I, t I tell you now, the secrets, what would we say behind locked doors? <laughs> so come in, Polarbröd, is what we say behind locked doors. Um, now, on that note, I would like us all to just zoom out from the little Polarbröd of 400 people working in villages in northern Sweden to the entire world economy. And as I'm sure you've seen before, this is the classic picture of macroeconomy. Uh, at, uh, at, when, you, when you want to describe how the market works, or maybe why the market works, how um, you can say that it's a classic depiction, because the price and quantity of everything produced is set by the market, and the basic idea of the demand curve, the red one, is that the cheaper the price, 
the more will be bought of, of that given good. You have a high demand at a low price here. And, and for the supply curve, we see the, the opposite logic at work, with farmers, for instance, wanting to sell more potatoes at a high price and fewer the lower the price gets. Where the supply and demand curves meet, we find the equilibrium, so-called equilibrium, balance punkt eller så kanske, that sets the price and quantity at which buyers and sellers agree, this quantity at this price. And this is why the market works so well, is the argument. Okay, let's look at this then. We've had growth by cheap energy, with fossil energy. Because the, the cheaper energy is the key resource of productivity. And if, you, if that if the price goes down, you will have a growth in the in affordable quantity. So this is what uh, modern Western society is used to, or maybe I should even use the word addicted to. So I've put the time period for this for about 1830 to 1970, because in the 1970s we had this first oil shock where um, there were different geopolitical things going on and where the oil producing <coughs> countries of the Middle East decided to come together and raise the price of oil. And that be became a huge economic crisis in the Western world. And it's been become cheaper again, oil, for a while, but then, quite recently, we hit another and much more definite stop to the possibility of growing by cheap energy, because we reached peak cheap oil. I'm sure you've discussed this at this, at SLU. So, what do we do when we can't grow by cheap energy? This is, uh, by the way, a picture of from Charles Hall, where he showed that the key to this, uh, why we can't grow by cheap energy anymore, is that the amount of energy that needs to be invested in retrieving energy is increasing. Look at this difference. Um, <coughs> this pale orange thing, it says consumption. And how much energy we can consume is dependent on what will be left after having retrieved the energy. So when we are starting to drill at six kilometers um, deep, at a depth of, of six kilometers outside of Brazil, it's of course much more energy expensive than if you're just drilling five meters down and, and have self-pressured, perfectly fine oil being just jumping out of the ground as it was in the in the early days of oil. So um, this is the background to why it will become more and more expensive and there will be less energy or for consumption. Anyway, when this stops, no growth, that is a terrible situation for, for the modern world, and that has to do with the idea of interest on money, which I'm not going to talk so much about today, but it's maybe the topic of another uh, presentation. Um, you can have growth by credit. Because, okay, supply can't be any cheaper, because energy is getting more expensive. So any, if, um, any efficiency measures you make will be eaten up by the energy price going up. So then, you, then we had this not so brilliant idea to increase growth by credit. That means that loans have been given to consumption so that people have more purchasing power than they actually have in the short term. And we can continue the journey of growth that is so uh, um, pleasant in the short term. Because if, if the economy grows, there will 
it's it's more it's more it's what did you say on the on the journey here? It's socially more workable. Um, so let's look at the total of this. We've had growth by first by cheap energy and then by credit. But back to the price mechanism. One might as well argue this shows why th the market doesn't work. What do I mean by that? I will show you. Because uh, as the, the, the pale, these dots showed, we've, we've gotten used to a quantity of consumption that is unsustainable. First, because of the fossil energy is not as cheap anymore, and it's also created unwanted secondary effects like maybe the, the storm Sandy or um, bad yields, agricultural yields around the world this year because of the gases trapping heat um, and making productivity go down instead of up. And this, this step to reach these levels of quantity was based on credit, and when there is debt saturation, you can't increase the levels of debt anymore, you will have a contraction. People need have only one way to go, and that's to try to, to uh, uh, diminish, reduce the debt. So you have less purchasing power, and you go on the journey of down in the quantity consumed. Um, so the market doesn't work simply because we've had, we haven't had all the information put into the prices. We've had so-called externalities. And I think that the only thing, thinking about it in a principle, structural, on a, on a lev structural level, it's quite obvious that it's not until you have the actual costs in the prices that the market can work. How can we choose between a, uh, you know, a holiday to Thailand or are going if, if 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 it's not if the prices are not showing the real impact on our choices on on the world we, we i i think i i firmly believe that until this happens we will not have any change in behavior we have uh, still I, I would say we have two oh look at the clock so i don't talk so long but i have 20 minutes it's fine um um we have tried two ways of dealing with the, with the climate threat. And that's super macro, Rio process. Have the leaders of the world meet and try, and try to agree on uh, setting new, well, whatever measures need to be taken to, to counteract this. Did it work? No. The American lifestyle is non-negotiable, maybe might be the most memorable quote in this process. And it <laughs> turns out that nobody's lifestyle is negotiable. Why should just Chinese want, the Chinese are just following the Western world very, very rapidly, growing at GDP growth rates almost at 10%. Uh, they want the same lifestyle as we have. And their actual um, emissions increased last year within the same um, emission that, like we added an entire new Great Britain just in one year. Did, did, I make, did that make sense? Did you understand? Yeah. So, because there we don't include external externalities in the prices, we are consuming too much. And the other way we have tried to, to, to uh, deal with this is the super micro level, where we inform everyone that th what we're doing is not sustainable. We should have, you know, think ethically and we should we should make the right choice, and things like that. But that doesn't work either, because we have all this purchasing power. So we use it. So, so we just use it with a bad conscience. But we're still using it. So I would argue, and I did so in the, for the Commission of the Future of Sweden, that we need to have laws that include, that force everyone who produces any service or, or uh, good, uh, that to, to actually pay what it costs. And my argument is that 
for Polar Bread or any other human enterprise, it's not possible to, to know if we are tier two sustainable. That is just not just resource efficient within, within the prevailing system, which is tier one, and which is when you can argue that it's, it is um, profitable to take care of the environment. Yes, if you talk about pure resource efficiency, it's profitable. But tier, tier two, when we if we need to in include the externalities, we will actually have face higher costs. The wheat will cost much more that we would use. The transportation would cost much more. And now we're coming to, um, okay, this is, okay, we will have the dreaded degrowth in quantity. Uh, when we do this. I will soon come talk a little bit more about Polarbell before I finish. Uh, just one note on this theoretical level first. The question, can, we, can there be green growth? The whole, the whole uh, aura that's, uh, that this uh, commission, want, the, the thing they wanted to, us to answer is, how can we provide green growth for Sweden? And my answer, if you ask me, would be, well, there can be green growth, but it depends on what level of consumption you're starting from. If we're already over here, it's not possible to have green growth. Because we've been like, you have this steroids that pushed up first oil, fossil energy, then credit. And we have to remove that to, to have something sustainable. We will fall back to some sort of natural productivity level. And then you also, as I showed you before, you add the external externalities. You, you, you provide, you have, we, have, we, we grow our food properly, for instance, so we don't destroy the Baltic Sea. We'll have more expensive food and less money for leisure and things like that. But anyway, from that, if, if we could just figure that we'll find some way to shrink our economy in an orderly manner, there could be green growth from a lower level of, of consumption. Because what I really want to, to, to emphasize is that even if there is no growth, that doesn't mean that there is no human ingenuity and no innovations and things like that, because we need a lot of that to, to uh, deal with this predicament that we're all in. A lot of innovation, a lot of good ideas, s more, more s resource efficiency. Um, however, whether that leads to growth or not depends on what level of consumption you're starting from. And let's also remember that the planet is not just Sweden. One third of humanity lives in energy poverty. They are not, they cannot rely on, on e electricity they, can, they might be electricity for some time or not, it's erratic. And that's called energy poverty. And people living in that, maybe like for instance a woman in Africa who needs to walk 10 miles every day to, f to get firewood. If, if she would get access to a stove fueled by solar power, she's starting from a much lower level of consumption. And there is plenty of technology right now that will give her green, green growth more productivity, smart solutions, innovations. So, so um, green growth, yes, depending. So what does this mean for Polar uh, My family has been baking for five generations. And um, as I told you before, the reassu quite reassuring message from SEEK does not mean that we can be certain that we can bake for five generations more because it only means that we're in the essential bread business and we happen to be quite resource efficient. But what changes do we need to make in order to be tier two sustainable, sustainable for real? We've, we've looked into that and we see three main areas for our business. It's agriculture, most importantly. It's also transportation, of course. And it, uh, it's also packaging, <coughs> because plastic is, ba is, an, is a petroleum-based product, and we, uh, we don't know yet if we would remove fossil input from the system, if it would be possible to recycle the plastic that we have. I don't know. So maybe that's something we, need, we would have to change. 
Um, so we have started out by defining what that de defining what we mean by sustainable agriculture because we had this naive idea in the beginning. Okay, we understand the prevailing prevailing agriculture is not sustainable. That is, it will not work in the long run. So we need to change that. Let's ask the scientists what is sustainable agriculture. And then we'll just listen to them and obey them. And it turned out <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> we, we had a little problem there. Yeah. <laughs> and the problem consisted in... If you ask scientists what's sustainable, you get 14 different answers. It will not be. Exactly. And it depends on which perspective you have on sustainability. And it's a very tricky thing to define. Exactly. Because some people emphasize the ability to feed a lot of people. That is having high yields. Some people emphasize uh, uh, ecology and things like that. So we actually, that's why, that's the background why Cindy, um, our eminent analyst, spent the entire summer <laughs> reading through the state of the art of where, what does, what do the scientists say about sustainable agriculture? And she presented um, uh, report that was submitted to uh, to the, the board of Polarbre, and we d decided that this is how we we are comfortable with this. This is a good definition of sustainable agriculture in our perspective, and it has four um, aspects that we need to heed to. First of all, um, eco psych Ecocyclical, um, ecocyclical maybe. Kretslopp, um, helt enkelt. It's it's self self sustained system. We need to have things going round instead of a, instead of in and out. Um, we think that in the long run it needs to be fossil free <coughs> because energy and and uh, oil is running out and it is problematic to just mm, to use it even if it wasn't running out uh, sustainable agriculture needs to be eco services friendly ecosystem tjänstvänligt um, because for instance if there are no bees there won't be any pollination we're we're stupid to destroy eco services. And finally, the aspect of of the human aspect. The one, two, three could have um, could could have my, um, most easily maybe been achieved by uh, eradicating humanity. But we do realize that that would be quite a bad thing to do. So why not? Uh, put this last but not least. We need to feed humanity through the, our agricultural practices. So this is what we should strive for when we, we are currently in the process of talking to our suppliers. If we want to buy grain with these aspects uh, to hands to, uh, to this, um, what grain do you have to sell to us and at what price? And it's not an easy thing. But we're as at least we're asking the question and, and s at least some people are glad we're doing it, not everyone. So it's a journey and we're s we are trying. Uh, but uh, at least we know, I would say, if you agree with me, Cindy, there are better and worse uh, raw materials for us to buy with these um, criteria in mind. So um, we also have things that we are looking into. How can we have fossil-free transports? More on rail, of course, but not you can't reach every store in Sweden on rail. So maybe electrical trucks, maybe uh, biogas, biogas fuel trucks. 
Maybe we can use some of the waste. When bread, get, bread gets too old in the shelf, um, we take it back. Part of the service, or we, the partners we have take it back. Maybe that can be fed to, uh, to pigs, a pig farm, and then they it can be manure, and then it can be biogas. Like That's an idea we're looking into. And finally, an interesting a question I personally find very interesting is, okay, fine, we have a lot of hydropower in, in northern Sweden, but if we use it, somebody else is using, using dirtier energy. We have this, we buy green electricity. It just means that the residual mix is getting browner. That's a problem. So maybe we should introduce more renewable energy on the grid. So we need to invest. We need maybe to have an, an, electric, uh, an energy company that invests in wind or solar or something like that. So that might be an option. Um, so this is what we are focusing right now. So, okay. Anything, just a final picture. Everything boils, for, 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 since we are in the food business, for us it boils down to this question. How much more are we willing to pay for our food? Thank you. Thank you very much.